Hey, this is John. Let's Talk Native is now on Patreon. You can support the show by going to patreon.com slash let's talk native. We will be producing exclusive content for our Patreon supporters. Thanks for checking us out. Let's Talk Native is produced at the LTN Studios on the Cataraugus territory of the Seneca Nation. We break all the rules for Native media by peeling back the layers of assimilation and indoctrination. No prayers, no buffalo speeches, and no spirituality shows. While this podcast does not provide a path to spiritual enlightenment, we do take a tough look at history, oppression, and our survival. We highlight the voices of native activists, writers, poets, artists, thinkers, and musicians who are fighting for the rights of indigenous people all over Turtle Island. We may step on a few toes through our examination of culture, art, politics, history, and identity. But the real goal here is to bring our people together by breaking down what separates us. In this moment of historical change and social justice, our voices matter now more than ever before. So, welcome to Let's Talk Native with John Kane. Say it going. Welcome to the program. Hey, you know, in the past, I've talked about, uh, obviously, this time of year being the, uh, the silly season with, with elections. And it's not just the non-Native elections. It's the Native elections, too. Uh, and, and I've also talked about the things that we can do in spite of not just elections, but in spite of governance, uh, in spite of uh, the so-called leadership, in spite of all of it. And, and, and a lot of what, what I'm going to talk about today is stuff that could apply to whether you live in New York, downstate, you know, if you're a U.S. citizen, if you're a Canadian, you know, whatever, not, this isn't just, doesn't just apply to Native people, but it certainly does apply to Native people. Because, look, many Native governments have very little voter participation or even, and if they're, they're so-called traditional governments, they have very little input input from people. I mean, it's you know you have this this sense of leadership just reproducing the same kind of you know policies, the same kind of attitudes, and, and all of that stuff. So, I mean, and I'll, I'll give you some examples. Uh, Seneca Nation, the voter participation, and it's an elective system here in the Seneca Nation. The voter participation isn't very high. It's you know, I mean. I know that the voter participation is well below a fifty percent, probably closer to thirty, but uh, or or maybe even lower than that. So it's not a very big percentage of the population who determines who the leadership is and what the governance is going to represent, so to speak. Um, and in other places, we talked about it here in the show, in, in Six Nations, for instance, only like four percent of the population even votes in their elections. So you have. You end up with these situations where you have federally recognized native governments. And when I fed, mean, say federal, I mean both on the Canadian side and the U.S. side. And this is everywhere. I mean, this is Akwesasne, Gonawage. I mean, uh, and uh, you, we, you go out west in some of the other native territories, non Haudenosaunee territories. Voter participation in elected style governments is very, very low. <clears throat> and like I said, um, in the so-called traditional governance, uh, governing systems, there's probably even less uh, participation and input from the broad-based population. So <clears throat> what does that do? Well, it creates a detachment. In fact, you, you hear it in many places where you say the nation. And when they say the nation, they mean the government. I mean, it's not even the nation. It's, they just mean the government, you know, the, the officials, <clears throat> and that they're separate from the people. They, oftentimes, even when I'm talking to people, I say, well, you don't mean the, the nation. You mean the people. You mean not the Seneca nation. You mean the Seneca people, you know, if, if, if that's the conversation that I'm having. So you end up with a, with a complete detachment. And oftentimes that detachment leads to 
uh, even more dissatisfaction from the people as far as how the governments actually function and and or or not function. <clears throat> so, I remember a, a number of years ago, there was. Um, I, look, I used to always attend a bunch of meetings, and and you know while we always really endorsed the, the you know trying to utilize Guyana to Goa, you know our what people call the Great Law of Peace, as you know kind of a foundation for for how we should govern govern. Look, I'm gonna admit at 60 years old, I can't see a whole lot of places where that uh, has really been implemented in a in a big and meaningful way. I'm not saying that, that nobody follows Guyana to go. I'm not suggesting that. I think there are people who have that as part of their foundation, I guess. But there's hard to see too many communities that do. And and, and the same could be say said in, in, in other territories that have you know a traditional basis uh, in their history, but very little of it in their contemporary lives. And and that's part of the reason, frankly, this this rift between uh, you know, traditional and non-traditional, you know, or traditional or elected style governments. Part of the reason there's such voter um, lack of a voter participation in those elections is many people reject this idea of voting. Period. You know, that's why I, I kind of get a kick out of people when they say that we should be voting in the non-native elections. How we don't vote in our own. <clears throat> so this idea of having these values. This is part of that cognitive dissonance that I talk about. Look, we we are taught. I mean, even today in, you know, culture classes, native culture class, Seneca culture classes, whatever, you know, you're taught a certain way that our people lived and it's completely detached from the way we live now. You know, my, my buddy Matt just posted something on Facebook about what the qualifications were, or really more so the disqualifications for leadership, according to Guyana Goa. And when you read that, you realize that well, wow, half of the half the people who sit in leadership, traditional and, and elected system, would never have qualified under those more traditional and you know older qualifications and and requirements to to be considered a quote unquote leader or or a voice of your people. But so this disconnect between having these systems in many cases imposed upon us through the Indian Reorganization Act or the Indian Act in Canada or whatever. The, the systems of government get put on our territory. And look, I'm not saying that we don't have a role in that. In the Seneca Nation, they chose somehow, for some reason, to uh, n rather than uh, follow a stricter or, or be more thorough in how the Guyana and Goa worked, they, they threw out the whole chief system. The fact that they even called it a chief system is part of the problem because it should have been a clan system. They threw that out in the, in the mid-19th uh, century. And adopted a uh, you know a constitution, only a couple of pages long. It's not even much of a con you know, not much of a document, and and I think a, a relatively small uh, again <laughs> small group or small percentage of Seneca's actually made that decision, but it, it's a decision that en ends up sticking. <clears throat> so even though it was a small group, and I heard at some point I heard that it was only thirty or forty Seneca's that made this decision. I mean, but. You never get to the place where you have a significant broad-based participation in these governments that replaced the traditional government. And so you have that, but you also have a degradation of what people view as these systems of traditional governance. I mean, one of the examples I always give is that when the Seneca Nation adopted its the constitution that it currently operates under, I guess, um, in, I think, 1848, women didn't have the right to vote. Well, how is it that in a system under Guyana de Goa where women have not just equal rights, but they have very specific responsibilities that that give them, you know, a level of autonomy and equality within a system that's balanced and the men, the power of the men and the power of the women were balanced. How could you have that system if it was functioning replaced by a system that would, would strip away 50% of the population, and sometimes higher. I mean, many of our territories, there are more women than men. Um, so, I mean, if you, if you adopt a constitution that, that eliminates a, a, a right, I don't think women could run for any of the offices either. I mean, so, it, you know, and, and this is another place that kind of cracks me up. When I hear people talk about, oh, how influential the, the Haudenosaunee was in the women's suffrage movement. Really? 
look, if you want to look at something historically and say women women had significant uh, responsibilities and power within the Haudenosaunee system, but at the time that the women's suffrage movement was happening in the United States, Native women were being marginalized by Native men as, almost as much as the as the white women were. So this all leads to the to what we currently uh, experience today, where Native governments. And, and, and look, this does somewhat apply to the, to the non-Native governments, but Native governments are constructed, they're, the seats are filled, candidates run, uh, and the winners of these political systems, these electoral systems, however, you know, however they, they operate, gain the, the power of the federal governments and the state governments, the Canadian federal, the provincial governments, through this recognition that this system that yields these leaders is legitimate, even though the voter participation is very, very low. So we, we come out of the gate with, a, with a, a fairly high level of discontent in any of our native territories. And then when the burden gets shifted onto these governing systems that don't have a whole lot of voter participation and, and really public support. Like I said, 4% in six nations in, in Oswego. And, and again, let me remind, part of the reason you have such poor, poor participation is because there are competing ideologies in every community. That's not exactly the, the case here in Seneca territory. The longhouse doesn't compete with the elected systems for political power. Not here, but in Alpe, Aguasasne, Gunawage, Six Nations, <clears throat> that absolutely is the case. So, yeah, so you end up with, with a fairly broad segment of the, of the population that doesn't necessarily support ban councils or tribal, elected tribal councils, but they're forced to depend on them. Sometimes, you know, they, they carry a ban card or, you know, you know, or a, a, you know, some sort of enrollment number within that these elected systems control and that's the only way they can get health insurance that's the only way they can get certain benefits as you know as an enrolled member even that concept of enrollment is not uh traditional in any sense of the word i mean look there's a, there's a crazy thing that exists um in many native territories where the territories are separated by geography so you you have Essentially, Gunyakahaga that live in Six Nations, Gunyakahaga that live in Oswe, uh, um, in um, Aquasasti, in you know um, Gunawage, in Gunazadage, and in all these places, Tindanega, and they're separated as um, band members by the geography of that of that place. How in Seneca territory here? You have the Seneca Nation, which is you know Cataraga, Allegheny. And a couple of acquired territories, uh, in Cuba, um, the little Cuba Lake area, not the country Cuba. <laughs> and then you have the the Tonawanda band of Senecas, and you look, they, you know, so there's there's almost competing interests. I mean, there are people that are quote unquote Tonawanda Senecas that live in Cataraga, and and they aren't they aren't considered Senecas as far as the Seneca Nation of Indians is concerned. So all of this stuff just adds to this to the dissension that exists in our territories. So what's the solution? Well, I remember I remember a number of years ago, you know, and I want to go back maybe 10, 15, maybe even longer ago than that. I remember being at a meeting that was talking about the failures of um of band councils and elected councils. And and that conversation did kind of you know creep into even whether the longhouses had stepped up and, and that kind of stuff. But, but it was primarily condemning these elected systems. And one young guy said, why, why don't we just run the band councils out of these territories? And it wasn't here in Seneca territory necessarily, although the conversation might have taken place here. But they were talking about just eliminating these, these band councils, these tribal councils. And, and, and I spoke up and I said, you know, I understand the emotional... Uh, response that would you know lead somebody to to that suggestion, but the problem is they do serve some functions when they're territories, and why do they serve some functions? Because we haven't stepped up, we've relegated, and and we've you know b almost by default given a certain amount of responsibility or power to these to these systems, even if they aren't necessarily uh, being the most responsible or re responsible over over the services they're supposed to provide. So my question is. Or my, my, my suggestion was, why don't we just make them irrelevant? 
which is the topic of the show. Make them irrelevant. Well, here's, here's what I'm talking about. If you have what you think is a governmental failure, and this, again, this applies to non-native territories as well. But if you have what you consider a, a governmental failure, if you have a, a failure in the process for, for selecting government leader, leaders or, or officials, if you have a, a complete mistrust for the system, if, if all those things, the immediate knee-jerk reaction should, shouldn't necessarily be to eliminate it. Why don't you take control of some of the things that they, that they, the things that they fail at most? If there are some specific services that your government is not providing that you as a people know that, that you need that service, form your own collectives, form your own organizations and, and do those things, you know, fulfill those responsibilities. And the more you, you can demonstrate that you through the people, not through an elected system, not through, you know, through a, even necessarily through, you know, a clan system, although it could certainly could be used. But if you say, look, I'm not going to talk about government. I, I want to talk about needs because that's what government's supposed to do, right? It's supposed to help provide the needs for the people. So if, 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 you, if you separate this idea of this institutionalized government system and you get back to a place that says, no, we have a need in this community. And that need might be, maybe it is security. You know, um, COVID-19, you want to, you know, protect yourself from infection coming in. Maybe it's, it, it's, it's drugs. Maybe it's all these things that it, that it could be. So if you, if you begin to assess the things that, that you see that are the most egregious failures of so-called leadership, the most egregious failures of, of so-called government, all those things, and you as the people, and I'm not saying everybody has to do everything, but if, if you as the people begin to take some of that responsibility away or fulfilling the need and making the government irrelevant, you can begin, I mean, you don't have to take over the government. They can collapse upon the, uh, within their own weight. Now, look, I know what people are going to say. Yeah, but they're the ones who have the power. They're the ones who have all the money. Well, there's a whole lot of things that we can do in our communities that don't require the, the so-called federal recognition to do. I mean, look, we could, we could feed ourselves. We could, we could, you know, agriculture is one of those places that we could do cooperatively. Look, I just got, got reached out to because there's a, um, an old family farm in downstate, just above New York City, that, uh, you know, basically the guy's family pretty much died off and he, and he wants to um, use this land and open it up for people. They have some equipment. They have some, you know, of the know-how on how to farm. And to open it up so people can, you know, from other regions can go there and grow food. There, there are places all over, you know, all over on either side of that imaginary line, U.S. and Canada side, where there are people who have land that's never been put to use in terms of growing food. On most of our native territories, we have space. We have plenty of space for, for growing food. It's just not put, put to use. So if you form your own collectives, and I'm not just talking about, you know, you know, you know, all these huggable communes. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying getting together with people to say, look, um, we want to grow, you know, th this crop or that crop. And then we want to do some things that are going to process the food. And, and look, we see it in some places here in Cattaraugus, there was an effort a number of years ago to grow more white, white corn. It wasn't a, it wasn't a nation that was doing it. It was individuals that were doing it. And people were saying, you know, look, uh, we have a field of white corn. You're going to come pick some. It, it wasn't as organized as it possibly could have been, but people were all of a sudden consuming more white corn than, they, than they've ever, ever consumed. And this came after a period of time where people couldn't find white corn. Now look, people here were, were trying to get it from six nations. There was a, there was a non-native guy who was growing most of the white corn that was supplying uh, Cataraugus. And I don't begrudge him for it. He saw a market, he had the equipment, and so he grew white corn. But so we, we see, I mean, this is an example that isn't, you know, I'm not suggesting something brand new here. This is something that, that people have begun. But I think the example of doing agricultural projects, community gardens, of, you know, um, collective stuff. I mean, look, there are ways that you could invest money or, or, or whether it's sweat equity or whether it's what, land, you could invest in growing more food that you can distribute. And of course, then we can get into processing, canning, freezing, whatever. So that's a way that you, you, you take this. Along. Now, look, the Seneca Nation is doing an ag project, and I'm not trying to undermine them. But 
it's a it's a relatively small project uh, project you know for the the population. So there you could actually cooperate with them, and they've offered that cooperation. So to the extent that you know, I'm not just talking about doing something that the, that your the government fails at. But maybe it's something the government just isn't far enough along with in terms of servicing the, the overall population. So there, there, are, there are food issues, you know, food sovereignty issues. Well, food sovereignty isn't just about the nation doing, you know, producing food. It's about the people doing it. And, and I think any real conscientious effort to develop uh, food independence and food, uh, food sovereignty requires more than just a, a large governmental agency. You know, and unfortunately, the problem is once, you know, government gets involved, it becomes bureaucratic, it becomes polarized, it becomes inefficient. And, you know, if something isn't that efficient because people are working collectively and, and there's a certain amount of helping themselves, to, to, that's not a terrible thing. I mean, where it gets terrible is when people are helping themselves to the, to the cash and to the dollars that are supposed to go into a project and the mismanagement of funds. But if people are providing the, the tools, if they're providing the land, if they're providing their own labor, that's harder to, you know, to, to, to take it, you know, to abuse, so to speak. So that's one of the examples. But look, there are a number of things that we could talk about in this regard, uh, you know, and agriculture is just, just one of them. But food sovereignty is one of these, look, it's a concept. That has become very popular to talk about. It has become, you know, trendy. And I don't say that in a, in a bad way. I'm not suggesting that, that it's a bad thing that this is a trend that we're kind of on. I think it's, it's a good thing. But the idea of, of trying to take control of certain aspects of our lives that we think the governments are failing at, um, that, could be, um, that could be much broader. Look, education is a, is a big deal. We know that our kids, our native kids, are being failed miserably in uh, in public schools. And now I just, you know, I think I just heard Donald Trump try to give some speech about how they're going to. Um, I mean, it reminds me of the McCarthy uh, MacArthur era, um, McCarthy era when there were the House Un-American Activities, you know, kind of act. These kind of laws that where the United States says we're not going to teach the truth in history. We want we want to tailor all the history to promote patriotism. We want to you know do everything to show the, the nobility of the founding fathers. That's literally the um the language that, <laughs> that Trump was using today. And he condemned like the 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 1617 is that what it's called 1617 project? Yeah, he condemned this this project that 1619 when the first African slave ship came to Jamestown, I guess. And, and look, and that's been a very successful program to at least you know, demonstrate the, how slavery in terms of the African slave, the, the, the chattel slave trade gets its start in the United States. And, and he condemned that. Why? Because he says, well, there's so there's such a, a movement on the left to, to, um, to condemn the United States as a evil racist country. Well, sorry, but they are. I mean, so if Trump has his way, and and look, it isn't just Trump. I mean, this is something that states have condemned. Look, I remember that uh, rediscovering, or, or is it Rethinking Columbus? There was, there was a book that was published that, Rethinking Columbus, I think it was. It was banned in Arizona. So there where you have, you know, a, a large, you know, Latino population that should know the truth about Columbus, because, I mean, look, brown people who speak Spanish are... Are native people for, for the most part. You know, they're they're indigenous people, and their uh, indoctrination and assimilation into some Spanish culture, certainly Spanish language, Catholicism, um, all came from you know, as a direct result of the genocide committed by by Columbus. So when you have an entire state that says, "No, we're going to ban this book. We won't allow this book to be used in schools." That hurts our children because they don't get a chance to learn any truth. I mean, I just had a conversation with my, with my own grandson just yesterday talking about why, you know, you know, why I don't support the American government in terms of its electoral system. It's, it's, you know, the way it operates in general, the flaws and all that stuff. And this is just, you know, this is my young grandson. But we have to teach, we have to have these conversations because what they're learning in school is all, has been this system of, patriotism. I mean, I, you know, I told them, look, they taught you to, to pledge allegiance to the flag when you're five years old. Do you know what any of those words mean? And, and he's like 
you know, and he's he's ten years old. He goes, no, I I I don't know what those what it means. And I mean, think about the words, you know. And most of you have it ingrained in your head, you know, the Pledge of Allegiance. But think about those words that they make you, and they made you say them things. And the kids, even today, think they have to say it. I mean, I'm telling my you know my grandson, you don't really have to say that. And well, the teacher say you have. I said, well, if you tell your teacher that that you don't want to say that because you, you that your family feels different about that that or that you do you have a right not to say it but see so when we when we talk about education we know that we need to step up you know so we spend even if we're responsible to our children which i don't think we are when it comes to our education part of the responsibility is is unteaching them what they learned in school not just Columbus and, you know, the, the great founding fathers and the you know, Pledge of Allegiance. There's a lot that we have to teach our kids by, by removing, by, by, again, unteaching them what they were taught. So what a waste. I mean, I mean look, and I say unteaching, you're, you're really reteaching. You're, you're teaching them truth to, to essentially wipe out the, the mysteries that they were, they were taught. But again, lots of effort not to te- not to you know, give this all uh, this alternative narrative, the, the true narrative, the counter narrative to what has been pushed out pushed out there. But I'll tell you, COVID nineteen, there's a, there's an upside to it. Everybody's being forced to rethink what education is, from the university level down to you know to grade school. There may be opportunities that come out of you know, some of this, not just distance learning. I mean, distance learning, that concept's been around for a long time, but it's never been had to be implemented the way it is now. So there's an opportunity for us to, to look at education in a different way. Not only how, how it's implemented, but what we are going to consider valued, um, valued education. So, and this doesn't require the nation necessarily to do that. Look, you could, there are individuals all over the United States and Canada, but in the United States, that have formed these, these um, pods. And they're just grabbing groups of people. And, you know, and, and there's some of the, the, the curricula are available. But we can tailor the curricula. We, we can actually, we can do these kinds of things ourselves. So there's an opportunity. Look, I realize the school changes now. You know, so if we do this thing, we're not talking about the, the, quite the, the same kind of social interaction. But it, once we do this stuff, the idea of actually building larger pods to where they actually become schools. And they don't have to be schools in the way that public schools. I mean, these public schools are multi-million dollar operations. And the amount of waste and the amount of, you know, just, you know, <laughs> I mean, the amount of money that is, that is flowing in different ways. I watched a, a, a movie the other day uh, that talked about how these schools in Long Island were just taking money. I mean, and look, they, once they convinced the people, you know, oh, yeah, your taxes have to go up because our school budget has to be $14 million this year or $20 million this year. And the people just get paid because there's a status symbol that comes along with it. Well, even in places like around here where there isn't necessarily the status symbol that is associated with schools, there's still a lot of money that's involved. And I mean, I, I heard some, and and I might be off by, in, in Buffalo, the budget for the city, uh, city schools of Buffalo, if you break it down to a per student, it's somewhere between 20 and 30, I think it was $30,000 per student. There is no freaking way that those kids who are graduating in the Buffalo School District are getting a thirty thousand a year. Now I'm not talking about you know for their whole high school career here. So I mean, and that's of course that's tax dollars that's coming in from the state, and the, you know there's, there's probably federal dollars and all kind you know all kinds of ways that they they fund these things. But I'm just saying that we could actually take not just the Seneca Nation, not just, you know, Aquasasne, not just, I mean, as groups of us, we could take more responsibility in, in, uh, in, in what we educate and how we educate our kids. And that's not an unreasonable, that's not an unreasonable thing to, uh, to, to take on. And because of what we're learning about teaching in the way that we're teaching now, this might be the best opportunity for us to, uh, to really revisit it. All right. Hey, uh, we're gonna take a break. And uh, we'll be right back, uh, right back after this. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native.
Okay, thanks for coming back. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. Um, again, I'm talking about what we can do to make uh, the governments that we don't necessarily support, the, the politicians you know, that we don't necessarily support, the systems of government that we don't necessarily support, how to make them irrelevant. Well, part of it is is beginning to take some of the control. Look, I talked about you know securing our territories. Look, we don't need to have police presence. In fact, there's, what do they call those uh, uh, autonomous zones? Is that what they're calling? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, there, there are places that are telling people, don't call the cops anymore. You know, uh, let's, let's deal, with, deal with crime, if you want to call it that, or, or disturbances on a community level. Don't, don't even call them anymore. It's not worth it. You know, the, the cops just bring more trouble into, into a community. <laughs> I mean, these exist now in places in the United States. And they certainly should exist on our territory. We should stop calling the cops. And we don't. We haven't. So, I mean, we see pushback for things like tickets. We see pushback when, when the police, you know, are, are doing things that, that we don't necessarily want them to. But we're, we're still going to call them on our, you know, on our family members, on our neighbors. We, we still do it. I, you know, I said we stop. And, you know, and I'm not saying the nation, uh, look, as many people say, well, the nation should, uh, you know, tell the police they don't have any jurisdiction. Well, if we stop calling them, they'll stop coming. If we start dealing with some of the issues, so when I talk about security, for instance, I mean, look, there are some territories that have problems with people driving through their territories at high rates of speed. Well, look, I remember when, when my son was a kid, one of his, one of his, high, or his grade school buddies on his bicycle gets clipped by um, correction officers that are that are driving fast because they're probably running late trying to get to their to their prison their good prison jobs, so they're trying to get there and and almost kill this kid, and and, and we see it time and time again. I'm not saying we don't have our own <laughs> vehicle problems on our territories, but when it's we when we we see some of this stuff on a continuous basis, especially some territories that don't necessarily have a a marshal service, which may or may not do much to stop this, but there are other territories that, that, you know, or they don't have PKs, peacekeepers, or tribal police. You know, and frankly, the tribal police, most of them are essentially deputized as outside police. So they're not our own way of dealing with the stuff internally. That's still calling the cops as far as I'm concerned. So there are things that we can do that, that not only push off the dependency on the outside, but we can do some of the things that can begin to push back on even the responsibilities that we may have relegated or delegated to the nation officials, but never been happy. Look, we're seeing it with this uh, Seneca mothers against, um, you know, against drugs, whether you agree with them or not, they're, they've taken some of this, this issue to heart and, and they're doing some things about it. The crazy part is you see an effort by the people and then all of a sudden they start getting nation support. And it's hard to know, is that really lip service or is that to try to, again, make them irrelevant? See, th this idea of trying to make them irrelevant, that could be turned around back on us too. You can, you can start something that seems like a good project and pretty soon the nation's saying, you know, I like what they're doing. Let's, we're going to do that. Or maybe we can take that project over. And it may not seem like an, a, you know, a, you, know, uh, you know, some sort of aggressive move, but I've seen good ideas go very badly. Look, th the tobacco industry. When private sector decided, okay, we're not going to um, uh, uh, pay or charge New York State tax, that wasn't the nation that got involved in this stuff. I mean, these were individuals who, in in, in certain territories, individuals took that risk, and it was a risk. They didn't know it was going to fly, and of course, the, the the conflict with the state. So, a lot of the the private sector development that took place on our native territories, it wasn't the nation doing it, and it, and. Some places organized, going to walk it organized, and they, you know whether it was through their their warrior society or whatever you want to, the, the men, they organized the businesses so they could protect each other, uh, gen generate some um, a budget and uh, and dollars that they could utilize for various pro projects. But it wasn't it wasn't the nation doing it. I mean, it was it was being done through a collective of people who were committed to this kind of thing. So what I'm suggesting is not as far-fetched or unreasonable. And I, and I think people have to understand, we have much more control over our lives than we give ourselves credit for. The problem is we don't, we don't exercise that power. We don't exercise that authority. So, I mean, I think what we want to do, even economically on our territories, in terms of commerce, 
there's a, there's a lot of commerce that we could do that, that that isn't necessarily based solely on the exchange of uh, of currency. Yeah, and, you know, bartering is something that is that might be really, really old school, but there may be ways of giving credit, and I don't mean measured in dollars and cents. I mean ways of of crediting a service that is provided, and then you then you look for that to return a service and that kind of stuff. I mean, back in, look as as family members. Before we start really associating, you know, with how much your your son or your daughter owes you in terms of money, or or your uncle or your aunt or your parent, whatever, you would do for your family members out of their need, and then when you needed something, they would help you. You didn't have to put a dollar value on everything. We can return to some of this. This isn't this isn't regression. This isn't like you know turn you know turning the hands back and and trying to become you know, some, some ancient Indians. No, this is about using common sense on the needs that we all have. Look, home building. There's another example. Uh, you know, for years, the only homes you saw on native territories were trailers. Some of those trailers were old FEMA trailers that, that, you know, maybe the nation could pick up for practically nothing or, or, or whatever, or, and then as we had, what was considered, you know, gainful employment, mostly off territory, we could get credit to buy a trailer from, from a company like, you know, Champion Homes or, you know, or Owl Homes close by year. So, and the reason we could do that is if we stopped paying, they could just back up a truck and pull it out of here. We could lose that home. See, we can't collateralize the land the same way. So for all the homes that you saw in our territory were per, or pretty much mobile homes, not modular, mobile homes. Stuff that if we didn't didn't fulfill the payments, if we got behind the payments, you know, the company could, you know, could, could pick it up and take it out of here. You know, now the only, the, the homes that, that we did have that were, you know, permanent homes, they were either people who could build their homes themselves and peck away at it, build little bit by little by little, build it up, or people who came into money. Whether, you know, the classic were people who retired with, with a pension or, or, or perhaps they got hurt on the job and they got a settlement or, or something like that. There were settlement payments that were made for some of the wrongs that the outside government did to our people. Like, you know, some of the m dollars that people got paid for, you know, uh, the flooding of Kinzua, you know, a reservoir or, or whatever. There were, there were people who came into money who, would who would put it into building a house. But for the most part, Unless you were really, really gainfully employed and, and made a, a really good living, you were going to have a, a, a very nice permanent home dwelling. Now, <laughs> the exception to that rule was when housing dollars started showing up you know, for these, again, these elected systems. And mired in all of that was going to be, well, who gets to have a home? Well, if you went onto most native territories, you could see the people who were in the nice houses were the ones who worked for the band council or worked for the elected system. I mean, it, the money and the, these these programs were were lopsidedly skewed towards the people who were involved in the in the government. I mean, you could literally see the haves and the have-nots based on who worked for the tribe and and who didn't. And you know that became more equitable over time, but you still the, these were programs usually administered in some way or uh, some fashion by the federal government. But so what's changed? Well, one of the things that that's kind of, well, before I even get to what's new, but in, even with all this stuff, we still had a, an absolute short uh, coming when it came to home starter homes for people. I mean, I, I, I mean, you literally didn't have your kids that could leave the nest until they could somehow posture themselves to either buy them, you know, finance a modular home or get a home through a nation project or, or something like that. So you didn't have starter places. There was no apartments in, in most native territories. There was almost, in fact, I don't think there's a single um, apartment building in, uh, in Cataraugus or Allegheny, with the exception of, of some of the, the oak tree, the, the senior living kind of stuff. So, Nobody sees that as, as a viable investment to build a building that, you know, that multiple, a multiple family dwelling. I'm not saying we don't multiple families living in some homes. That's, that's a whole other issue. That's not, a, uh, that's not apartment dwelling. 
Um, but so what's, what's changed? Well, there is something that's, that's new, and that, that's the tiny home movement. Now, tiny homes can provide all of the necessities that people need to, you know, to, to start a family. And you can, you can build on them. You can expand them. Make them bigger. So as your family grows, you can grow. That's something that doesn't require a nation housing program. Look, you can buy a, 30, a 36 foot by 12 foot shed from the Amish for $4,000. I mean, you could start there. You know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I go back and I think about the the little homes that our people lived in in, in uh, you know in the 19th century. I mean, you can still see a few of them. These hand hewn built beams and I mean these, these tiny little log cabins that our people lived in, and they raised four, five, six kids in these little places. Now I realize when you you reminisce about these times, you think, oh no, we're not going back there. But you know, you don't need to. I'm just saying that we did know how to live. We did know how to raise a family in a smaller space. Why? Because that home was just where we slept. We used the outdoors more. We used a sense of community. The longhouse, for instance, was, was, a, was not just a, um, a, it wasn't a church. It was a place where you, could, and the cookhouse associated. These were the, the community dining places. So if we embrace this notion of, of, of tiny homes as, as a way to provide better homes, better quality, but smaller homes for our people. And we, and we configure these homes to really build communities out of them. I don't mean just you know, residential areas. I mean communities. So you, you orient them with common spaces, shared spaces, and that kind of thing. These, again, these are the kinds of projects that we could do without nation funding, without state funding, without federal funding, without provincial funding. So... Again, these are the kinds of things that we can do that, for all intents and purposes, can make the nation projects seem less relevant. And if we raise the quality of our life by taking some of these, these responsibilities away from them, then we, we show a different way to go forward, a, a different way of life. Look, these are big projects. And, I, and I've talked about this before. I don't know how many people that I see have pickup trucks with plows in the front of them. And they'll drive right by the neighbor's, neighbor's driveway and never plow it out. You know, and there's kids you know, with snow shovels. I mean, again, my buddy Matt tried to put together a team of guys that would help with those long snow rakes there, remove the snow off of people's buildings. One of the biggest you know, uh, um, causes of damage in the wintertime is the snow load on some of these houses, including <laughs> modular homes and mobile homes. But these snow loads can, not only are they heavy on a roof, but the way they freeze because of poor insulation and water backs up underneath, you end up with water damage in the house. It would take nothing to put together a team. And it doesn't, this isn't a job, it isn't necessarily a career, but it's, it's these kind of services. Plow a driveway, shovel a walkway, take snow off of somebody's roof. These are things that if we did these things, because I'll hear people say, well, the nation hasn't plowed, they, they take care of the elders' driveways. Well, if you drove by, you know, you know, five or six elders in your neighborhood because you had some non-native person who was going to play, pay you to plow their driveway off territory, you know, why not? this isn't about sharing the wealth. It's about doing, just being courteous to each other. Well, look, when somebody has a fire in, in our community, we all rally around them and you know look we not only do fundraisers and chinese auctions and you know we you know put the donations together when somebody's in crisis you know a, a sick kid you know a, you know a tree lands in somebody's house you know if a if a nation project isn't there to help somebody recover from a tragedy we as a community we usually step up i mean we do so we have the capability we have we have the heart for it we just don't do it. We, we just don't call upon that part of ourselves all the time. We, we, sometimes it's too few and uh, too little and, and few, few and far between, I guess. So these are the kinds of things that if, I mean, they, all, they, they sometimes get these programs funded where they said, we want to do a community needs assessment. <laughs> community needs assessment. And, you know, and these are really... Um, uh, well-defined programs where they, you know, with surveys and that kind of stuff and all designed by white people. 
<laughs> you know, the, we're going to do a, 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 a needs assessment for our community. And I've never seen any of these things published in a way that says, well, when we we surveyed our community, these were the needs that were identified. For one thing, if the boxes are already determined for you to check, that's not probably as accurate a needs assessment. I mean, at least do something that's more general and open before you refine it down to some boxes. Because if we're if we're just using the the, the boxes that are used for for you know non native communities, not everything applies, and the solutions aren't necessarily going to be the same. Look. And to you people who live off territory, I'm not saying you don't have, you know, some corresponding needs assessments that, you know, that, that we have. You, you certainly do have some of them. But I think you have to understand that the, the target, the, you know, the, who are the people that you're the clientele that you're you're trying to create this needs assessment. And again, a needs assessment is about assessing what are the needs of a community. And when we when we do these things, we should let you know, the sky be the limit. Um, and I don't mean just in terms of dollars, but I mean, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of thinking outside the box. We have to have a better sense for, for really identifying, because if you have a housing project on your territory, it doesn't mean that your needs are being uh, met by that, that project. That's get back. It gets back to what I'm talking about where government doesn't necessarily fulfill its responsibility, the responsibility that we assume that they have. So we need to do more. We need to be, look, I, the, the first and immediate thing is you can determine from your own family, what does your family need? But if, if you're not prepared to step up to even help your family uh, be housed properly, then you, then you can't think beyond your family. You can't think com community if you're not uh, looking at your, at, your, at your own family. And when you think about what, you're, what, your, your, what your family may have as resources, this should be immediate, right? This, this should be the, the no-brainer kind of thing. So whether it's, does, do your family, does your family members have enough food? Do, what do they say? Uh, warm, dry, and fed. I mean, that, those are the basic necessities of life, to be warm, dry, and fed. If you're not determining whether your family is warm, dry, and fed, now it's, it's hard to go beyond that in terms of education, in terms of you know, some of these other needs that we have. But this is something that we can all do. And so it, it, it not only starts with your family, but however you came to live with the neighbors around you, whether you, you know, are close. I mean, in many places, you will see a family, you know, all the, the fam family members live in, a, in the same area. And that's easier to, to make sure that your family works together. But I tell you, I see a lot of dysfunctional families that, that can't get past, what, you know, what somebody may or may not have said 10 years ago. But this is the thing. This is about responsibility, accountability. This is about the things that we do within our, again, not just our, our family and our community, but our, but our social circles. How do we hold each other accountable? I know we don't do it very well when it comes to politics. Look, we, you know, we'll see... People elected who have screwed people over, you know, you know, cheated on their wives, you know, never raised their kids properly. <clears throat> but we we vote for them anyway because it seems like this election is isn't. And, and I'm not saying we vote in a big way, but I'm just saying that these are the people who who are the perennial favorites to win elections. And it's because they they've no they they've learned how to get over on people. That's how they took advantage of the people that they that they screwed close to them in the first place. <clears throat> so you know, we, we have to get away from that. And and again, as I said in the beginning, the best thing we can do is make those who fail to, to do the things that they need to do. The best thing we can do to make sure the people who fail to do the things they need to do is to make them irrelevant and not depend on them. And I know that's tough. I mean, we, we talk about, you know, the health services in our territories. And I, look, I'm not saying throw it all away. I know that there are places where, you know, some of the people that I'm closest to say, no, I won't even get a band card. I don't, I don't want to be enrolled in their system. And, and I, I, look, I can appreciate that stance. But oftentimes that leaves people vulnerable. It leaves people vulnerable to you know, where they're going to you know, look if they... If, Look, we don't we don't have the healthiest population between diabetes, not even talking about COVID nineteen, 
but between you know the, the needs for dialysis you know and you know some of the other health issues that we face you know everything from you know from breathing issues to you know any number the cancers that show up on our territories and none of these things are accidents you know some of what's been done to our environment it can definitely contributes to it you know not just our diet but you know what we the lives that we um were confined to because of u.s or canadian policies but even if we were confined to those lives doesn't mean we have to just take all the consequences we can do some things to mitigate some of those consequences so that's what I'm suggesting here. So when I see the level of discontent, and, and I, like I see it in the non-native communities and I see it in the native communities. For me, I'm not saying it's a simple answer, but the best answer is to become less reliant. I mean, I remember seeing a, a, a small town near Albany, Troy, New York. And I don't, I don't even know if this is true. I, I knew, I, I know Troy, New York. I, I lived out that way before, so I, I know the area. But Troy had a, a, um, uh, a resurgence in their, in their community. And, you know, their, their employment rates improved and, you know, the, the mean income improved and everything. And what they tried to suggest in terms of the, the leadership, and I don't mean just elected leadership, but, but the community leaders of Troy, they said, we've become more and more apolitical. We're not, we don't bind ourselves to, to the political parties and, and the infighting that takes place between de Democrats and Republicans. And so they found a recipe for success in a, in a small you know, suburb of Albany, New York, that allowed them to have some, that, that allowed them to improve the qualities of their lives. Now, I, you know, look, I, I'm not saying that I've, I've run them, run a test on them to see if, if everything they say is true, but that just that suggestion that we can, become less politicized whether it's native politics whether it's you know state or whether it's federal and we start depending on the politics less and less because that's how you make them irrelevant you you do more and more as a community as a family within your social circles to make yourself uh independent of the very thing that you that you become disillusioned with, you know, the governments around you. I think this is a necessity. So, hey, I want to remind people that uh, that we are on Patreon, and if you go to patreon.com slash Let's Talk Native, you can become a member. I want to remind people if you are not subscribed to our podcasts or to our YouTube channel, which is Let's Talk Native TV. Podcast, by the way, just search Let's Talk Native with John Kane Podcast, and you'll find us on all the, 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 the major podcast platforms. If you're not subscribed to our channel on YouTube and our podcast, you might be missing some content. So I suggest that you do. Uh, I look forward to, to interacting with you more. Uh, we can take your comments on Facebook. We can take your comments on, uh, on, uh, on YouTube. And of course, you know, Feel free to reach out. Reach out. I look forward to look forward to your comments. I want to give a shout out and a, and a, um, a thank you to my the, the main sponsors that I have, which are Ross and Holly John in the RJE family of businesses, Eric White in ERW Enterprises, and the good folks at Grand River Enterprise. I want to thank um, thank all of you who contribute on a regular basis, and I want to give a shout out to those who um, on occasion drop a check in the mail to help us uh, do what we do here. Uh, this is. We're always trying to advance a conversation. So your help helps us do that. I want to thank you for listening. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. You know what?